exam season and visits from external moderators and thinking about whether we've got it right. Modeling visionary communicator. I'm just reading these out. Teamwork, inspirational, creative, embracing, yeah. Modeling, yeah. Showing, <laughs> being what you want, to, want others to be. Um, and that's really where it begins. You, you have to, which hopefully you can see the quote now, to be a leader, you have to lead yourself first. And I'll use another analogy, which is, you know, if, if the plane's going down, you pull the oxygen mask on to yourself first. You have to look to yourself in order to be that, that strength, uh, that leader, that support for others. <clears throat> um, and hopefully that's going to be a key, key message <clears throat> that we, uh, we move through tonight. So thank you for that. Um, superheroes all. Um, hopefully you received your cape along with your certificate when you qualified. Uh, <laughs> and I bet you've been using it in, in good time this year. Um, but you have rights too. And that's, that's, that's incredibly important um, to bear in mind. And Sean's going to be talking to you about that in a moment. Before he does, I want to just um, pause to think about um, what's different about being an art teacher. I've been working in art education since 1992 when I trained uh, and did PGCE. And I've got to tell you, everything I've seen through that time convinces me that it is different to be an art and design teacher. That's why you get your own specialist trade union votes because uh, you have special needs and they need to be attended to. But what does that mean in terms of um, the demands that have been made of you? I'd like you to just take a moment to read through this slide, if you would. There's lots on it. Just, just have a quick skin, skim read of it, scan it. This is the code of practice, the code of conduct, if you like, that uh, the um, American uh, equivalent of NSEAD, the um, Association for Art Education in America, NAEA, this is what they follow. All their members sign up to this. And we, we took this to the AGM this year and we talked about what might a code look like for NSEAD members. And it wasn't so much about saying, let's have a set of rules for NSEAD members, more a sense of higher purpose and uh, saying that out loud, that, that we are doing things above and beyond the teacher standards, mm. above and beyond those professional, um, pre professional expectations. So as we go through this, you know, there's all stuff there that you'd expect standards in public life. Um, there's all the stuff you'd expect around safeguarding and that care, duty of care to your learners. But there's also stuff in there about being true to your subject. So I just want to ask, do, is there anything in there that you really would passionately argue against? And you think, no, that, that's not something our educators need to be burdened with. Is there anything that you would add to it if you were writing your own code? And I think we've got everybody promoted to panellists. So uh, if you've got the power of voice and you want to holler out, please do. Uh, if you haven't got the power of voice or you just don't want to holler out, pop it in the chat or just reflect and keep it to yourself. All is good. All is good. Any thoughts? And Sean, if there's anything in there that particularly chimes with you or you want to comment on before you, uh, I hand over yeah. rights to you, <clears throat> please do also. So the one that I think uh, got, got the most discussion at AGM um, was the second one, promotes art as a basic discipline in the education of all students. And that, what we talked about at AGM a lot was that, that, uh, that burden of being an advocate and having to fight for the place of your subject. 
And that's something that we're doing all the time. I mean, that's the truth. Um, frankly, we always have been. Frankly, we've been doing that since 1888 when MCAD started. But the point I'd like to make is um, that is an extra thing that, that uh, the arts, arts teachers do. And I don't think there are many other subjects in the curriculum that carry that advocacy weight. So, you know, thinking about that and bearing that in mind, um, that's, again, something we want to talk, touch upon over the next hour, about thinking about the support that's there to help you do that. Um, but also I'd be interested to hear, you know, as we go through, if you don't think that's reasonable, say so. Dotty three jumps out for me, Michelle, um, in terms of the advocates art instruction by certified art educators. Uh, um, I, I do pick up from a trade union perspective um, a, a watering down of curriculum offer by schools. Uh, this isn't necessarily a, you know, a, a MAT thing or an individual school thing or regional. This is very much a national thing. But there's all I've even had people saying, well, anybody can teach art. And no, they can't. You know, art teachers are, are a quirky group in many ways, but they are highly skilled, highly competent, highly educated people who are you know, it, 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 to be perfectly honest, when I put my children into school, I want my I want my I want my children taught my people who are qualified in the discipline they are teaching, and that's something we really do need to stand up and fight for to make certain that we we represent ourselves fully there and art is taught by art educators. For sure, for sure, one of the big um, threats I would suggest uh, to to that principle of art being taught by people who've been trained to do it, like the people in this room, I presume, is uh, the, a blurring of distinction between subjects, as you say, a watering down, mm. um, but very particularly in terms of the way the curriculum is being organised and the place of design and technology. Um, increasingly, we're seeing all kinds of, of ways of managing design, technology and art and design uh, in curriculum planning. At its worst, what we see is um, a, a mashup uh, where there isn't any real distinction, there isn't a real sense of the <clears> different <throat> pathways and, and uh, aspects of the subject. And so they're, they're taught interchangeably and we've got d &T teachers teaching art and design pathways uh, and vice versa. That's not good. It's not good for the students. It's not good for the teachers. It's not good for choice. Um, so yeah, lo lots of issues in there. Um, and, and folks keep an eye on that because this notion of, of code and saying loud and proud what it is that you do that is so special is something that we're going to be running through throughout this this uh, this next 12 months. Right, I'm going to hand over then on that next slide um, to Sean. Um, I'm hoping that this is reasonably visible. I do apologise uh, if it isn't. I did cram a lot on one slide, didn't I? <laughs> well, it's also my screen view. I'll, I'll be frank, it's not, uh, not all that I would like it to be. But yeah, right, over to you, Sean. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Um, Apologies for arriving late, folks. I um I I left school dead on three ten, so uh, I, I got home as as literally as quickly as I could. Um, I I do want to say in terms of um learning opportunities, professional development, just because you know teachers gain QTS or they've got degree or masters, it doesn't mean your learning stops. You know, uh, I've, I've I've had people say to me the day I actually stop learning in the classroom is the day I really need to retire and give up because. It's a constant learning sort of you no know, curve for sure. Um, so in terms of your learning not being over, you have a right uh, and uh, a number of different documents to continuing professional development. And this is a, a key right of yours. And uh, I've, I've put in the white box in the bottom left hand corner, you know, professional developments, you know, some schools may call it uh, appraisal. It's not something that should just be allowed to happen to you. It is something that is a two way process and you are central to influencing, directing, controlling, you know, leading on what you actually want to achieve in your own professional development. I'm sure schools will, will, will typically give you two you know, or three, and they'll try and even squeeze a few more targets in. Uh, and one of them should be school related, you no know, link to the whole school development plan. One of them may well be a departmental based thing, but professional development ultimately is, is an investment in you. And it's it's not something you should have dictated to you. It's something you should very much be central towards determining what is the actual you know, specific element of CPD. So in terms of trying to identify what the characteristics of CPD are, I've come up with a seven point um, characteristic plan there. 
um, which just reinforces these key points. And, and by all means, you know, when you actually attend appraisal meetings, they typically take place in the first half term back because schools should um, have all the information needed to make their determinations about performance related pay and appraisal done by the 31st of October. Um, so this is the kind of piece of information you can take into the meeting and say, look, number one, this needs to be relevant to me and my needs. Um, you know, I am a reflective practitioner, so I want I want it to assist with the planning and preparing of my teaching resources and my teaching practice. You know, you are, as I said, exceptionally qualified people. You are professionals, and as such, you should be treated as such. So it should be you know, driven by you and led by you. Um, your CPD should provide you with training, which is, as I've said in number four there, is hands-on um, you can then apply in your own classroom environment. It shouldn't be just theory based or, or whatnot. It should be, you know, rolling up your sleeves, getting your hands dirty, in leading to improvements there that you can actually tangibly measure as well the progress that you're making and the pupils that you're teaching are making. Obviously, because you are the person leading it, it's going to be something that you are going to be motivated by. I mean, that's always a key thing. If you've got motivation for something, it's going to be something you're going to work harder to actually uh, you know, achieve. Um, from a school perspective, schools measure a hell of a lot, uh, as, as, you, as you're very well aware, uh, in terms of pupil progress, of course, you know, we've got lots of external measurements, what have you, but good CPD in terms of translating that into results is going to allow you to actually demonstrate to, to the powers that be that this is, you know, a, a practical use of, of funding if needs be, but a practical use of time to invest in you. Because the bottom line is, this is an investment in, and that's how it needs to be seen by a lot of schools. Um, and unfortunately, a few too many pay lip service to their own needs, but you have got to be driving this for yourself. And it, as I said, it, it recognises you as an individual. You are a highly trained individual. That's reflected, you know, in terms of the status that many people in society hold teachers in. You know, we are an esteemed profession in many ways. And this allows you to be treated as a highly trained professional and allow you to develop the areas that you need to develop because you should be party and central to that decision making process, not having it imposed on you. So if we were to go to the next slide, please, Michelle. To assist you with performance management, again, if we go to the white box on the left, there is on the trade union FAQs element of the website, a fantastic um, uh, resource about performance management. It's effectively a definitive guide. Uh, it's, it's a fair few pages. I think it's about 50 pages long, but every element of the, the process right from the, the actual setting of the targets and how you go about that and the types of language to use to actually reviewing those targets a year later, they're all included with tips and tricks along the way. So please, please download that resource uh, and, uh, and, 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 and read through it and, and, and take it to heart, please. But what I'd like you to do, I've taken from the uh, early career framework standards below, there are five dotted points, there are star points, where the ECF standards say that continuing professional development need to be used in a certain way to develop you as a professional. And those are, I'm not going to read them to you, you can read those clearly yourself. But what I'd like you to do um, is, is, when you have a look at those points there, what ideas can you share with the fellow attendees today about how you can actually approach performance management to make sure it works for you in your best interests? And to give you an idea, uh, as an example, you know, something I might type in the chat box if I was asked to do this, I would go into the meeting with some very, very clear, firm ideas of what I want to achieve. I would be thoroughly prepared because at the meeting they will ask you, you know, for suitable targets. And this is your opportunity to influence. So if you're going in there with some very concrete ideas about what you want to achieve, and potentially you've even got the courses identified or you've even got kind of like places, you know, uh, identified where you could actually undertake this type of training or observing other colleagues or so on. If you've got that concretely in your mind, it's very, very straightforward by and large to actually influence the person who's your line manager holding that meeting to actually give you what you're needing. 
the difficulties with performance management come in when people aren't prepared and it's making it up on the spot and clearly that's not appropriate so the more prepared you are is would be one of my top tips based on those five bullet points so i'm going to give a couple of moments to you to see what what kind of thoughts you've got with regards to those five bullet points that we can share so we can kind of like walk away today and learn a few tips and tricks from each other potentially as to how we can get the best out of CPD. Okay. So we've got the chat function available now. set a tough question there haven't on we're getting a good answer straight away schools should be making money available for cpd there should be a budget available a lot of cpd i've got to be honest in recent uh, recent days has been um centered around the fact that uh, on the teacher training days schools tend to provide a generic cpd training session or uh, but there can well be something where you can learn from colleagues and there can well be a circus or something or a carousel that you could uh, you know um, put on within within a school as well in terms of delivering training museum and gallery visits for planning use of resources projects are due, a project i've lost the uh it's we're getting some answers so it's moved it out of my viewing low cost is very very appealing to schools for sure um but uh, the fact of the matter is if there's if there's something that is going to enhance professional development and furthermore can be evidenced in terms of enhancing the classroom learning experience and results as well then this is really a no-brainer this is something schools should be investing in um, we've got comments about given time to attend. Certainly, certainly. Um, CPD should time should be made available. I mean, quite clearly, if one of your asked, you know, one, one of your one of your sort of suggestions is maybe to learn from more experienced colleagues how they actually apply certain types of learning or certain topics in the classroom uh, or in the studio environment, that's an opportunity to go and visit them, but it shouldn't be done, you know, it shouldn't be done necessarily in your own time. This has to be done and and quite clearly school will need to fund that through arranging cover for you for that day. Um, we've got skill sharing across schools. That's a really good idea. Whole departmental CPD, including from PGC students with different specialisms. And again, I, th I think one of the things that really stands out actually across certain departments in school, and I would suggest, you know, arts and craft and design is very much up there. The, the concept of the NQT or the ECT coming into the department. That's a really welcomed one in many art departments because you're bringing lots of new ideas. In some more, so we say, traditional departments, quite often it's a case of these people know better, they've been doing it longer, they've got the experience, but it's a very, very forward thinking kind of department and subject discipline within, within art, craft and design. And new ideas are very much welcomed for sure. It's a very unusual art and design department that really doesn't want to welcome new ideas. So we've got skill sharing across schools and the way they're set up, particularly as mats or, uh, and of course, this used to be an idea that many local authorities would have championed. I know Michelle was, uh, was leading on things like that uh, a fair few years ago now when she worked at the local authority, but they, they, they did used to be cross uh, sort of you know, pollination of ideas and resources and sharing of ideas and that type of networking with colleagues is very helpful and finding a way we've got ma courses linking to cpd and linking you know pm to the school performance targets and again if you are effectively designing things that fit in with what the school needs and school aims and directions are in terms of being prepared and planning very much I think people are hitting the nail on the head big time here, Michelle. Oh, they're just um, really yeah. good ideas. Uh, uh, that last one, uh, I think, is is gold, actually. Find yeah. a, a way to link to school performance targets. We've we've got our former NSEAD that we kind of um, go to all our, our training. 
um, for you to fill in that's got a box where you can identify uh, where do, what does it hit mm -hmm. and, and we pull things off the Ofsted framework to, to help so you can go it's got, it's got one of those so you've got a button to press um, and we, we've got that as a CPD request form so absolutely recommend that you have a look at that use that um, and yeah take that kind of thinking into your performance management it's about leading it uh, you know not being a taker being a shaper the key thing though just to reiterate folks is, is about being prepared um, I've said it at the outset as my example, and I, I can I can testify to many, many teachers who go into performance management meetings and, and, and have things imposed on them. Uh, and, and they moan throughout the entire year, I've got to do this. Well, if they had spent half an hour in terms of reflective consideration, planning and preparing, and going into a meeting and, and expressing what they wanted to do, the chances are they're going to get something in, on, in terms of their targets that is, is, is going to be something that's going to motivate them. And when they have that motivation, it allows them to actually tick that box, get that, get, get that area succeeded, you know, all those targets have met. But they actually walk out with some, some tangible benefit as well. So it's, it, it is something you've got to invest in. But at the same time, if you invest the time there to come up with those thoughts and ideas, school are going to invest in you. They're going to see you as somebody who's dynamic, who's forward thinking, you know, who's a reflective practitioner, who's putting the needs of themselves, but also putting the needs of the students and the schools ahead of things. You know, those are the types of people you want to support as a school leader. Yeah. So be confident in your own power and contribution. Definitely. Um, I'm going to kind of pick up on that and, and actually some of the things in, in the chat there um, around the kind of places that you can go to get professional development and, and, um, and resources and support so that when you're going into those performance management situations and you're requesting uh, the kind of support you need to de develop, um, you know, you've got some proactive suggestions. And, you know, the, the fact is that, as I said at the, the top of this um, session, the ECF, uh, for ECF, the, the, the framework um, for uh, beginning teachers has got, you know, it's got standards. Uh, and along with that, there is a package funded by government of CPD to support. And there will be plenty of CPD going on in schools, the whole staff, um, and, and hopefully some, some departmental, but the an awful lot going on those those training days where you know everyone sits in the hall together and everybody thinks about literacy and how they can contribute to that that's all great but it's not giving you that kind of subject specific development um and depending on where you are that might not be so easy to come by so you may find yourself in a department of one <laughs> so it really is about you leading yourself um you may be within you know a bigger family of schools but still, you know, you, you might find that the direction um, and the, the vision isn't necessarily completely aligning with yours and that you want to shape it and change it um, and contribute. So it really is important to kind of go look for those communities of like minded souls that you can work with. And I'm going to, um, Claire, feel free to chip in or, or, or sit back and uh, just listen to yourself being praised. But uh, I mentioned Claire Stanhope and the work that she has done with the anti-racist art, craft and design education action group um, for uh, well over a year now. Um, now, this is a group of NSEAD uh, members, experts from our community, people who've stepped up because there's something they felt very strongly about and they felt they had a combination of uh, research knowledge, uh, expertise and, and uh, lived experience that they could bring to the community to make, make things better, to make change. Uh, and they've been working on that for some time. Uh, one product of that work are the checklists to support educators to uh, review and interrogate really curriculum and resources and publications so that they can be actively anti-racist. Um, and this has been something that has been so well received by NCAD members, our community and beyond. I was in a session yesterday uh, and Claire, I have to tell you, Mary Meyer, who's a bit of a, uh, a goddess of school improvement, singled out the uh, NCAD RAA approach to EDI and she said it was exemplary it was the best she had seen so uh, i've got there's an email winging its way to you to tell you that but you're here today uh, let, me, let me pass that on but this is the power of this, this stuff right this is 
this is these are priorities that are coming up from the ground from the community these are the things we want to develop in join that community get involved i've just told you about the work that claire and others are doing uh, on uh, anti-racist um initiatives um we've also got uh, special interest groups working on anti-ableist pedagogies, so really thinking about what we mean when we talk about equity, or when we talk about inclusion. Um, what can we what can we actually do, and what can we learn from art pedagogies to support um, being genuinely anti-ableist? Um, amazing work going on there. We've got a special interest group uh, looking at gender inclusivity, massive issue for our subject. We have a big gender gap. Sadly, boys do not see our subject as being particularly attractive, certainly by the time they get to GCSE and make their choices. That's reflected all the way through into the creative industries. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Be part of groups that are doing the research and developing the resources to turn that around. Um, and, and so many other things that you can get involved with. The slide I've got for you here, um, which will make your eyes bleed, but believe me, it's the it's just the top layer of a whole load of, of materials that are called the big landscape. These have been put together, or it's a massive piece of work, massive project, by an NSEAD special interest group, looking at um, how we navigate the complex territory, uh, the landscape of art, craft and design education, so that we can create and design and build curriculum that is right for our schools, for our learners, that's relevant and fabulous and rich. And that we, we start with the big ideas, we know what we want to do and why. Um, and we then drill down and we find a pathway, we find the, the how, the activities, the content um, and the pedagogical approaches to, to create the kind of learning experience that we want to see. It's massive because actually art, craft and design it's like a bottomless buffet of opportunity, isn't it? You can just, this just endless. It is almost limitless, the, the routes you can take, the things that you can do, and it constantly evolves and shifts. It is not a static uh, knowledge base by any means. So being able to lead your way through that is really important. And that's what this project is about. Some of our best educators in the UK working together um, in, in, a, in a frenzy uh, of creation to create this. It's, it's the NSAAD approach uh, and the, the tool that's going to come out of this is a portal that helps you to navigate and access all the best research, case studies, resources, and so forth. That's how you do it, folks. That's how you set your priorities. That's how you start to change practice in the field. That's how you take a lead. Come and join us, get, on, get involved, roll, roll your sleeves up, all welcome. Over to you, Sean. Relationships. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, um, as, a, as a bit of a callback to performance management before I move on to relationships, um, somebody mentioned about, about master's courses. In fact, Claire mentioned about doing a master's course. It is not unheard of for some schools to actually fund or part fund external qualifications such as a master's. So don't feel backwards in, in terms of asking what support there is there, by the way, because obviously any support you can get financial or time wise would be something you know, or even the opportunity to test out so, you know, any any work that you're actually undertaking as well is something that would be very supportive for you. So don't know, don't, don't don't be shrinking violets on that one. You know, if you if you ask and the answer is no, the answer is no, but you haven't lost anything. But if they say yes, that's a gain, isn't it, quite significantly? And what I would also do as well is direct members. Always I would direct members. We've got a fantastic members Facebook group. And it is staffed by such a supportive network of like-minded colleagues. And any question, any query you have got about your working life, uh, about relationships, about CPD, about anything, to be perfectly honest, curriculum, they there'll be somebody on there who'll see it and there'll be somebody on there who'll provide an answer or signpost you so it is such a fantastic resource that you've got as a member so please please make certain you know you you, you take advantage of such a fantastic networking resource of such you know and so many like-minded colleagues but uh, from a relationship perspective um you know as a practicing teacher myself as well as a trade union representative you know I, it's it's 
it's quite interesting actually how many differing relationships you have at you have at school i mean people often you know if you were to do the family fortunes you know top 100 you know what you know what are the relationships you'll have in school you'll obviously have things like relationships with fellow staff you'll have relationships with leadership you'll have relationships clearly with the pupils and then people are struggling to think necessarily of what are answers four five six and so on and um, there are many many types of relationships that you will have in school and uh, it's your opportunity to really really cement some fantastic kind of opportunities for yourself as well by actually negotiating these types of relationships so i, I just wanted you to effectively do the family fortunes you know what are your top 10 now what type of different stakeholders the school like to call them nowadays are you likely to encounter in your career as a teacher so i've named three already but who else are you going you know who else are you likely to encounter on a regular or even quite a irregular basis when, you, when you're actually doing your job in school and again if you can pop some answers in the chat that will be very helpful So who are you likely to meet when you do your day to day job in a school outside of pupils and parents and school leaders and, and other colleagues? Or should I have rephrased it in more of the pointless answer? See which people are like. <laughs> See the types Wait, of people. Sorry, not I'm not sure what people. you mean. You might need to rephrase that for me. I don't know if it's I'm just really hot, but what do you okay. mean? Like, who are you meeting in school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of the types of people that uh, influence and affect the way we work. So, um, you know, I'm a trade union person. You occasionally will meet a trade union uh, rep, rep in school or a trade union officer. Um, for example, you will meet external agencies. So, for example, Ofsted. Um, you may well meet governing members of the governing body. So I'm, I'm just looking to see the types of different types of, of people you may encounter um, irregularly and, and perhaps more regularly as you do your day to day job in school. Does that give a few examples? Yeah, thank you. And they're coming through, yeah. Practitioners, moderators, guest speakers, yeah. Who else have we got coming through as we're likely to meet? An artist in residence, outreach moderators, yeah, language people, um, site manager. <laughs> oh, two rights, two rights. Little tip with site managers. I always, always make a point of looking after the site manager in every school I have worked at, um, be it being, you know, uh, you know, finding out what their hobbies and interests are. I've had many, many chats about motorcycles and whatnot, even though I've got no interest in them. But the person who was the site manager was passionate about it. So I learned to have a chat and find out a few you know, snippets of information. You know, when it came to Christmas, that person would always get a little four pack of beer or something along those lines. And they'd remember you because not many people looked after them. They Many people sneered or, or looked down their nose or didn't have that relationship. But you know what? When it came to having things moved, when it came to having things set up, when things broke, uh, I clicked my fingers. And you know what happened? That person came running for me, not for a lot of other people, because I took time out of my day to, to value and respect them as a person. So this is what I'm talking about in terms of negotiating relationships in many ways. Um, so the site manager, definitely coordinators of competitions, people who donate, the groundsmen, all key, key people, all key people. Should we, should we put the next slide on, Michelle, just to show a few additional people that we're likely to meet, maybe? I've, I've identified, you know, there could well be you know, through people through competitions, but local businesses, they can often donate or provide resources, particularly 
you know, for art, craft and design departments as well in terms of, you know, machinery or equipment or, you know, any, any, any kind of like resources that you might need there. Uh, there may well be visitors from the local council, uh, you know, in terms of school improvement officers, but there are plenty of outreach workers from the council as well, people who come in to provide training and support. Obviously, we've got school staff, parents and families. families. There's a LADO. I don't know if anybody's ever, ever heard of the local authority designated officer, but if, if there's ever a safeguarding concern, quite frequently, the LAD, well, quite frequently, things are escalated up to the LADO, typically through a multi-agency safeguarding hub. Um, there will be a designated safeguarding officer in your school. We will have the direct phone call for that person. And many of you will have to use programs in school like CPOMs for registering things to do with safeguarding. There may well be sponsors and donors uh, who you're rubbing shoulders with at, at awards evening, or they may pop in more frequently. Obviously the pupils, there may be outreach work for the local colleges. If you're only 11 to 16 and you're preparing people, preparing pupils to go on 16 to 18, local colleges will have an input into school and may well again be somebody you can tap for information, resources, support um, in terms of the courses they're offering and how you can streamline that, that type of provision. Often they come into schools, local communities do, youth organisations, the police and exam boards. Those are just a, a handful of the types of people you can meet and some of those relationships you can really, really cultivate. But interestingly, and it doesn't surprise me because when I've asked those types of questions before, they don't tend to make too much of an appearance and it's, it's quite a crying shame. But if we click on the next slide, Michelle, um, and we can, we can blitz through that fairly quickly, I think actually, because it's just, I've just re-listed re some of these people here. But I would like to move on to the next slide. And the next slide is somebody who hasn't been mentioned. teaching assistants and high level teaching assistants. And these people are people you may well encounter on a very, very much everyday basis. And they can make your life significantly easier alongside any technician support you get. And a key element of the TA is they are there to support students who've got EHCPs or who have got SEN and ND, you know, special educational needs or disabilities. They are an informal resource for those types of people, some of whom may have learning difficulties, moderate learning difficulties, they may have speech and language issues, they may have English as an additional language, they may have emotional needs, they may have behavioural needs. You will encounter all these types of pupils, undoubtedly. And the TA is a conduit to actually help you assist these pupils to, to actually get the best that they can actually provide uh, you know, in, and so uh, in, in terms of delivering in your lessons. TAs are often treated by teachers, and, and, and this is sad to say, but they're often treated by a lot of teachers almost as an underclass or an afterthought. And I don't like that whatsoever um, because they are fantastically supportive people you can build brilliant relationships with, but they need to be used properly. And it is about an investment in time. With schemes of work, they very rarely get them shared with them in advance. If TAs know what is actually happening in your lessons in advance, or you can even spend five minutes with them saying, this is how I specifically want you to support this child or this group of children, they can do that for you. But many times they come into the classroom and they find out what's actually happening in that lesson when the kids do. And that is not the best way of using them in any shape or form. And they can make your life so much easier they can do some outreach work, they can take pupils out of the lesson for individual one-on-one -on -one or small group work, allowing you to concentrate um, you know, uh, on a smaller whole class as such. So in terms of their effective use, you need to be using TAs to deliver high quality one-to-one -one or small group support, structuring intervention work. And as I said, the way you do this is by communicating with them. Pop down to the special educational needs learning resource department, Get to know the people in there. Very much like the site manager, it's not about buttering them up, but it's about actually having a professional relationship with these people. And the difficulty is we're rushed off our feet. We don't make time. They may be part time. But you know what? When you value these people, that value is repaid tenfold and then some because they come into your classroom and they know what they're doing. 
they can be they see themselves as a valued resource not somebody who's who's is effectively having to use their own initiative to make it up as they go along you are there to direct them and the most effective use of tas the evidence shows every which way and how is when teachers and tas have proper professional relationships and you are directing the work they're doing so it's it, it saddens to a certain extent it isn't unexpected but we've listed a number of people and partners you're likely to come you know, you know uh, meet and, uh, and and come up with when you're in school but as i said every time i've done something equivalent to this tas go under the radar and they are such a massive resource which is why a whole slide and a whole five minutes of my time here has been highlighting the support they can provide you in the classroom seriously make fantastic use of them because they can make your life easier they can make your results better they can really assist in the classroom environment and when they are appreciated believe you me they go that extra mile as well anything to feed back in there about tas michelle at all uh, well only to say that it, yeah i mean it's it's recognizing the resource that you have um yeah it, it takes time though it as you say it takes time to, to do the planning, to do, to do the collaboration, but if you can, it pays off in spades, particularly in an art, an art context. Where your TA may not feel particularly confident, it has to be said, because they're unlikely to be a subject specialist. Okay, shall I move on? Uh, I want to talk about wider school culture. And uh, here we have, uh, our rare slide. So hot classroom or not, I, de I definitely feel that um, I need to hand the floor to, to Claire in a moment, just to say a few words about the RA checklist. Um, the, the reason they're there is because um, it's, as I referenced earlier, you can take an aspect of something that you're doing that's very important to you and uh, the intent that sits behind your curriculum and what you want to achieve, your big ideas for art and design education, and you can have a transformative effect that goes much wider than the art department. And, you know, the promotion of anti-racism is just kind of a really perfect example of that. It's important, um, you know, Ofsted, uh, who, who are the, sadly, uh, you know, they are the Bergen and in English schools, but the inspectorate generally, where, wherever you're coming from. Um, the great descriptors for the, uh, the framework in England, at the Ofsted framework are a beautiful thing. Like there are four areas. Um, the leadership one is fabulous, and that's the one you must always hold as a stick in those performance management uh, interviews because it is leadership responsibility to make sure that you get your CPD. So that's that's a beautiful thing to have written in, in black and white by Ofsted. But in terms of that wider school culture, two of the areas uh, on which schools are judged really, I think, go to the heart of what art departments can offer. So the judgments around personal development um, and behavior, are, are, we, we are absolutely all over it, frankly. Um, in terms of personal development and that responsibility of the school to ensure a wide, rich set of experiences, well, what does that actually mean? Um, what does that actually mean? You start, we go back to, you know, to be, to be leaders, we have to, to lead ourselves. Looking at our own subject area, how wide and rich is that? And then thinking about behaviour, again, um, our, our subject is, is all over it. Um, respect for others, um, respect for difference, difference being valued and nurtured is in the great descriptors for Ofsted. Communality is celebrated. Well, you know, the opportunities for us to do that, to foster that and the work we do are boundless but Claire I wonder if you want to if, and feel free to say no I'm very hot um but if you can unmute and just say something a little bit about about why you think uh, that particular area of work the, the RA work has got such impact across the whole school um so I from in, in this perspective of my school um there was quite a lot of work around anti-racism and developing sort of decolonizing pedagogies so the the impact on that the area document um was just useful because it provided language on which to hang things upon so um i think a lot of conversations around anti-racist anti-racism um can often or they do just elicit quite uncomfortable conversations 
Um, so I think the checklist kind of helped to sort of frame those conversations as a way of unlearning past histories of reflecting upon your own educational past um, and sort of taking it away from the personal and putting it as something that's like it's it's in the it's sort of in the middle of all of us and if we can remove the personal elements of of all of those horrible feelings that go with western colonial histories um whatever your background is from when you can sort of reflect on that and realize that they're learnt and these narratives are learnt it kind of gives a language on which you can then start to have really significant conversations in an educational setting rather than it always coming from you know um feelings of discomfort which i mean you kind of have to go through those first anyway mm. but it it does help to shift the narrative away from that um you know lots of conversations that i've been part of it's you, you know there is that um it can be quite defensive people can become quite defensive around conversations to do with anti-racism mm -hmm. um and quite understandably you know like there is you know we've all been there i've been in that i've been in that position of just feeling like the the weight of this and the the hideousness of a lot of the the legacies that this we're entangled with it's it is quite hard to start that conversation from a from a from a distance so i think the framework is just very useful for be to sort of really unpick and be quite specific about things that we can start to tackle and approach mm -hmm. uh, in very meaningful ways without people feeling judged and i think hopefully and the conversations that we had around when we were like developing the checklist, it, it was to support those conversations. Um, it's not like a blame game or, you know, it is kind of dealing with the mess that we are kind of in. Yeah. Um, and yeah. we're all in the middle of those situations, like everybody is, whatever the situation is. And it is trying to make everybody aware that, you know, this is a, a conversation that every single educator should be having, no matter what the subject. But specifically in art, when it's a subject that helped perpetuate colonial narratives through art history, we're in a very perfect position to then try to diffract them and challenge them and disrupt them. So framework That's, is really handy for that. Yeah, I mean, it's so powerful. And it's made, you know, I, I've seen uh, and, and heard about the difference it's making in schools, um, you know, since it was launched uh, this time last year, pretty much, in fact. Um, I mean, it is, is incredible. I'm really struck by um, uh, the, the power that we've got through our visual language to have these conversations visually um, as well as verbally um, and how that can make often make things a lot easier to do when we're working um, it can, you know, with that, that visual language. And I've got to just say to people that the slide here um, is taken from our website uh, where you can find the checklist that, that Claire's just been talking about. Um, please use them please do that if you, if you use one thing uh from the millions and trillions of resources that NCA has got uh, I'd, I'd say start there but this uh image is actually one from claire's school um and uh it, it's it's very powerful and it's an, a really good example of how we can have these conversations uh, and do it in the work with the students and model it for the rest of the school. And somebody said at the start of the call, modeling being one of those leadership qualities. And there you have it in that slide. Um, it is, it's just brilliant. And Claire, the work you're doing uh, at your, your place is amazing. And everyone, I've got to promise you, I didn't know Claire was going to be here. Um, important to say that. Thank you, Claire. Nice for the shout out. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, um, I've got to say to you, Claire, Mary Myatt, uh, Goddess of School Improvement, said that uh, the checklists were delightfully unpreachy. So you, you're you're achieving the aim there. Ah, oh, good. I'm glad to hear <laughs> that. That was very much considered. It's not a lecture. <laughs> Grand. Well, yeah, absolutely. You get enough of those, don't we? Okay. Um, we're going to move on to think about well-being. We're going to sort of finish up with um, well-being. Um, and I, I thought it would just be nice to talk, really. Um, so those of you that can um, uh, do, just just unmute and talk. There's, there's, it's a nice, uh, intimate enough group that we can do that. Um, and if you're not 
for whatever reason able to talk, uh, put your hand up and request to be unmuted and I'll, I'll see what I can do. But I wanted to just, you know, take a pause to think at this stage in the year, which is always tough, it's hot, we're tired, we're in the middle of exam mayhem. Um, you know, we, we've just had enough. We've been working with people all year and much as we love them and we value our professional relationships, they're, they're driving us absolutely uh, potty. Uh, we've had enough of the parents. We've had enough of some of the kids, frankly. Uh, we just want our holiday. It's really, it's a hard time of year. And this year, 2022, two years on of, of pandemic strain, it can't have ever been harder, I don't think. So let's think about well-being, shall we, and what that means. I want to share with you a disturbing headline from the survey that NSCAD um, helped to, to put together with our all-party parliamentary group. So you may have uh, contributed to that, in fact, uh, or you may not be aware of it. A large survey went out just asking people lots of things about the what's going on in our education at the moment. One of the things that came back from that um, was a really disturbing statistic. 67% of the people who responded to our survey said that, you know what, they were, they were thinking of leaving teaching. So these are all art educators, all sectors uh, from early years to FE, not, not HE. 67%, that's a lot. Um, and that, that's, that's more than I've ever known. And to put that in context, the um, NEU trade union did a survey uh, about a month earlier uh, and they got back 42% um, of their respondents, smaller sample than ours, but still 42% considering leaving the profession. So that's all subjects. So that's telling me that you guys, are carrying a load, yeah? Um, I, I know that those 67% will not leave. I mean, some of them will, some of them already have. Um, people will just carry on, but wow, that, that is shocking, you're right, Claire. And, you know, in that survey, four out of five people said the biggest disincentive to staying in teaching, so that included people who weren't planning to leave or thinking about leaving, but, but really felt, you know, what gets me down? Workload, well-being. They're under strain like never before. So what's going on for you guys? If you want to just speak, speak. If not, pop it in the chat and we'll just kind of all have a, a gentle read of the chat and see how each of them are feeling. If you want to just put in the chat, how are you feeling today? Um, do it with honesty. It's a safe space. Just to echo what Michelle's been saying there as well. Um, previous years worth of attending uh, another union's conference has taught me that the top priorities for members are not about pay and pensions, despite what public perception of teachers can be at times. It is very much to do with workloads. Uh, it is very much to do with the mental health and the stresses and strains, not just on your working life, but on your family life and your personal life. Uh, workload is is a huge issue and even more so with regards to the way of working you know many people refer to it as hybrid working now but uh, you know teachers are back teachers are in the classroom there are still kids off uh, with covid there are still kids off with other issues and there's still an expectation that provision is for you know is made for kids who are not in school while you're also having to prepare and resource and teach and deliver everything when you're in the classroom as well it is incredibly, incredibly difficult workload wise. That is very much coming through from the teaching profession. So I think everyone's allowed to talk. I think I've, I think I've managed to click the right buttons, um, <coughs> unbelievably. Um, I, I mean, a I, I, I big question I've got for you is, think about that statistic I gave you, you know, a, a, <laughs> that clearly shows us something bigger happening for our teachers. What do you think that is? Thinking about pandemic, thinking about what you might have experienced this year, particularly if it's your first year of teaching. Think about what you imagine is going on from colleagues beyond the art department. What, what, is, what is it that might be making us feel really, really ground down in art departments? Uh, 
one thing in the in the school that I'm currently in is that the um, the attainment for art for next year, the take up from our year nine pupils has dropped massively because of the pathways that they were put on at year nine. Um, I think we've gone we've gone from having something like 70 pupils at GCSE down to less than 20. Whoa. Um, and it's cut uh, our BTEC graphics and our BTEC textiles as well. So that's had a massive impact and, and I've, I've heard overheard a few staff members in the the um, the common room saying that they, they don't really know what to do. They're not sure if they've got the job security for next year and they're wondering if it's worth it to look for their jobs if or if they should just go back to being our practitioners rather than our teachers. Well, Kiva, how's that making you feel? I'm only a PGC student, so it's a bit um, unnerving to, to be at the start of my career and hearing about the the blocks that are put up against the subject. Like it's it's something that I might have to face in a few years. So it's a bit yeah, yeah. disheartening. Crikey, yes. Yeah. Look, that is disheartening and, and, and frightening. And, and it's a it's a reality because that is something else that came out of our survey was the uh, reduction in curriculum time. And mm. we, we know what's going on with GCSE uh, entries. Um, you know, it's the, there's there's been a long term trend on that. Mm. What can we do about it? That is the question. That's the question. Um, you know, how do how do we fight back? Um, I just recently had um, they my photography course was under threat, and like talking about how you fight back, Michelle, mm. yeah, because they they felt that they didn't. I got some like notice that that the the head maybe didn't want to run it because of the numbers. Um, but and I think like, I mean, it's obviously it depends on what stage of your career you're in, but um, I, don't, I don't think it matters what stage you're in. If you're an art teacher, you are definitely, definitely going to battle like most days um, to fight your ground for your subject. And um, I, can, I, I had to fight for that course. But, um, and I did that in two different ways, but one of them was, um, I mean, obviously if it's to do with blocking, there's not much you can do about it, but um, I did a huge promotional thing with the students and managed to get the numbers back up again. Um, but also with the senior leadership, I think a lot of the time when things happen in schools, and especially when you're tired and you're feeling quite deflated from things, um, you don't often have the willpower to do it. And I think when, if somebody's in their early stage of their career, they also, it's a confidence thing, mm -hmm. depending on you're going up to SLT. But actually, you know, if, if you can garner that confidence and go and make your point and go and make yourself heard, then then often in, you know, over my 20 years of experience, you tend to get listened to because I, I think with SLT and senior leadership, if they think they've got somebody in the classroom that's going to fight for this stuff and that can put a good argument forward and is really um, passionate about it, um, for want of a very overused word, but um, then they often listen, um, you know, and if they know that they're going to be coming up against a fight against something if they know that those students are going to get that quality curriculum they'll I think they often will try their best to make sure it sticks um, and I think we forget that sometimes and we often stay quiet and it is that that extra bit of energy that I think art teachers are required to have to, mm -hmm. to not that that will solve everything I'm not saying that art numbers go down um, because teachers don't fight because obviously they do and there's sometimes there's nothing you can do about it but I do think that um, yeah it's just that need or extra push to really push back against structures because SLT often aren't from art backgrounds so mm -hmm. they often don't understand you know and it is about getting out there what these things why these things are important um, and I think it was like you said before getting involved with things on the NSAAD and I put in the chat about everything I've ever done outside I've always fed it back into the my performance management just, uh, mainly because I know that the, the head will read it so, and the same with any of my department minutes, like I make sure that on the department minutes, and I think that's another thing, besides from performance management, when you're in department meetings, you know, those department minutes go up through the ranks. So it goes to your line manager, but it will also be read by the head. So asking, you know, if you're just starting out, but asking your head of department to have, you know, a, a, an agenda item in there every week around workload or around, you know, decolonization, around... Mm -hmm 
anti-racism around whatever it is workload it doesn't really matter well-being then those things you can minute and you can get your voice heard through these things or mm -hmm. if you've got concerns around curriculum um i always put in like you know things to do with what we're doing so but to make sure that they read the successes of the departments otherwise it just goes into a void yeah and i think a lot of the stuff which goes on in art departments just isn't known about for want of a better word and unfortunately slt often think um that they come into the art department and do a bit of art that's what i often you know they come and relax for half yeah. an hour and you know have a bit of fun with some paint um, and it's far from that, but unless you actually get out there and really tell people what you're doing and why they're important, they won't know because they're mm -hmm. not from the background. And I, and I, I think from my, and that's only my experience, but from my experience, that's very much how I have protected the department and the, you know, like the, the student numbers and all of those things, because I'll go hell for leather if ever, anybody tries to attack it. Um, <laughs> Um, I wouldn't want to be up really. against you, Claire. Well, that does, it does go against in some ways because obviously I've got I've managed to get we've got two art groups starting next year along with textiles and photography, but I haven't now got the staff some of the staff to teach my key stage three. So swings and roundabouts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be careful what you wish for sometimes. But I know exactly. So you know, but I think that, that is important. That is so positive, uh, Kiva. I hope you take a little bit of um. Yeah like strength from that, um, you know, from, from a colleague saying it's not easy, but you know what, Claire is so right. And you know, all the things we've been talking about this evening about leading um, and, and being confident in your subject and being confident to talk about it, being confident to say, this is what we contribute to the school. My takeaway from what you've said to us, Kiva, is uh, that we will do some more work. We've got tons of advocacy resources, so please do go and look at them for yeah. when you're uh, doing Claire's thing and, and you're in battle, yeah. as you will be. Yeah. But please use them. There's loads and loads of but, great stuff. But you know what? I think what we need what we need to do are do some uh, advocacy resources that are pegged really yeah. tightly to the Ofsted judgment criteria. Mm -hmm. We can give you some a script to take, so we're going to go away and do that. But link this also to what I was saying earlier about relationships. If you've only got the conversation with the, the SLT, that's that's a, a pretty basic dynamic. But if you've got a, a link governor, if you've got a, a line manager and you are feeding them all the advocacy information and how much you're going to fight for your subject, this then can feed into governor's meetings. This can then be outside of just that one sort of linear dynamic between SLT and the head of department and when it starts you know when, when they start getting pressure from external quarters because of the relationships that you've got and you've nurtured and built up who are all fighting your cause as well with words here words there that is really quite powerful as well so please make use of you know people like the governing body there's also staff governors as well on there there are parent governors there are lots of different avenues and if they're getting it in the neck externally as such from the governing body at meetings it, it, it forces them to think twice about decisions you know yeah. because they, they they're being scrutinized and scrutiny is an important element you know scrutiny they can make the decision that goes against you but as long as you are feeding into the conversation your voice is being heard and then they're going to have to justify and that level of scrutiny is really quite powerful and there are schools plenty of schools who really do value their arts uh, yeah. so you're, you're going to find yeah. the right place give it definitely right. we're going to finish on uh your your rights in terms of well-being to give you a little bit of power to your elbow thank you so much for that that discussion there claire and Kim, because i think actually that the way the uh fighting for your subject the, the fear of it not having the status and it disappearing chips away at your well-being you know that's that's been echoed it's echoed in the survey we hear it all the time it's our number one thing but that's what we're doing together um we'll we will prevail we've been doing it for 134 years and they haven't beaten us yet so <laughs> we've got much more to come don't you worry about that but right sean can i ask you to um uh finish us off with sure. some thinking about rights this is uh, my absolute baby this is um as you can see from the title, I'm the trade union principal caseworker and uh, and very clearly workload well-being um, teachers' rights is, is right up my street. Um, interesting observation, teachers in my many, many years of being a caseworker, um, they are the worst profession I've ever encountered for knowing their rights. 
Um, many, many teachers will see teaching as a vocation. Absolutely spot on because it is, and it is the best job ever on the best days. It could also feel like the worst job ever on the worst days as well. But teaching is a brilliant job and many people give their heart and soul to it, but they don't really pay attention to the T's and C's of things. Uh, and so a large part of where I'm coming from is, is to effectively say to teachers, um, in terms of frog soup, as I call it, uh, you can say no. And, and, and the reason I call it frog soup is there's, a, there's, an, there's an analogy out there where if you put a frog into a cauldron of boiling water, it will jump out because it will recognise the, 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 the intense heat and won't like it. But if you put that same frog into a cool, tepid, lukewarm cauldron and heat it up to the same boiling temperature, that frog will stay in there till it boils. Now, it's not the greatest um, picture to give you ahead of tea time, <laughs> but, uh, but the fact of the I matter is... It. Sure. So it's, it's rather <laughs> horrific, which is why I call it frog soup. But the gist of it is I, I find that many teachers are like the tepid water frog and you keep adding work and more work and more work and more responsibilities to a teacher and they keep on saying yes. But you have in your armory lots of opportunities to say no. And there are different ways of saying no. And I think it's important that teachers know they've got the, the right to say no to protect themselves and their, their work life and their well-being, Because you don't have to be coerced into, into agreeing and doing the school's bidding all the time. You go to work for a variety of reasons, but it's important at the bottom line is, if you are not fit and healthy and well enough to deliver your best for your pupils, then they're being let down. And, and it defeats all the arguments about vocation if you're not looking after yourself and not able to deliver. So that's very much where I'm coming from. Now, there are key documents that I rely on on a day-to-day -day basis as a caseworker. Number one being your contract of employment. Secondly, we have the teacher standards. We also have something called the STPCD, which is the School Teachers Paying Conditions document. And that typically is reviewed and renewed um, in September of every year to take into account what the latest pay uplift or non-pay uplift is. And then there's a document that exists since 2000 called the Burgundy Book, which is effectively the conditions and services document for school teachers. And within these four things are many unalienable, undeniable rights for teachers. And I'm very, very keen to see how many rights you actually know that you've got. OK, so a bit of a quick quiz, bit of a pop quiz. I'm only going to give you 30 seconds to blitz as many things that you know you've got rights for in the chat box. And then maybe over the next few slides, I'll surprise you with some of the things that protections exist for. Is that okay? Yeah. And I will try and keep this fairly brief. I could talk for hours on this, but uh, I, I appreciate we, we're due to finish at 5.30. Is that right, Michelle? Yeah, in the interest of well-being, we will finish. <laughs> and I wouldn't want to do anything about that. So we've got teaching time, meeting time. Yep, these are good things straight away. Health and safety. That's probably the biggest and strongest document I've got is the Health and Safety it Worked Act in 1974. It is phenomenal for our armory, undoubtedly. So Claire's come up with three good things there. Any additional things, folks, that we've got in terms of protections that exist for you in terms of your well-being? Okay, I'll just give it the last few seconds. We need a little countdown clock. Do 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 Yeah, yeah, I'd see right. Planning time, see we're getting some good answers, getting some good answers. Brilliant. You can put the close the chat off now, folks, because we'll refer to the next three slides one at a time. And I'll I won't read them all out. So I presume these will all be provided, won't they, Michelle, to, to people attending. Brilliant. Um, I'm just going to highlight a couple of key ones. We talked about performance management appraisals. When you actually have the appraisal review meeting, it should start from the assumption right from the beginning that all teacher standards are being met. That is a given. OK, so it shouldn't be a checklist they're using against you. The meeting should always start from the assumption that teacher standards are being met. If they're not being met, school should have raised them through uh, a support plan. 
And if they haven't raised it through a support plan, they've got no evidence to turn around and say the teacher standards are not being met. So the bottom line is, from an appraisal perspective, that is a fantastic right in your favour. Obviously, you've got the right to be paid. That's, uh, you know, uh, it almost goes without saying, doesn't it? Um, but quite often, if I just highlight this one here, you have the right to an, un un uh, to an uninterrupted lunchtime. We are seeing creeping, <laughs> creeping kind of like... Uh, uh, positions in schools where they try and and, and and are trying to coerce staff into working through their lunchtime. You are not paid for your lunchtime. You have you have no obligation to do anything at lunchtime. You have every right to turn around and say no. Okay, but I'm hearing some giggles there and some 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 uh, some chortles and whatnot. I kind of get the feeling that uh, some people are being used for lunchtime or it's, that that's kind my of. my fault. It's my own my own. It's hard. That's the thing when you're talking yeah. about schools. Yeah, like, you know, you get kids coming in and exam times. It just it's not people. The school's pretty good at all of that. But I think yeah. a lot of that comes from the teacher themselves. That's what you're suggesting there is voluntary, um, you know, and you're responding to the needs of pupils. But I have been in situations where schools have insisted on lunchtime working. Um, yeah. I, I, I did actually deal with it in a very, very proactive way to make a point. I took out all the members of staff from that school, including the ones who weren't member of the union or was at the time. And I paid for subways for two uh, for two consecutive days when there were no staff on on site. And it was left to the leadership team to run around and look after 1200 pupils. They soon learned very quickly. I could keep that up and school staff could keep that up, uh, you know. So there are tips to the trick and tricks yeah. to the trade as well. But lunchtime is your time. Yeah. They cannot dictate anything. And ditto PPA time, that 10 percent time you get should be timetabled in a, in, a, in, a, in a clear, proactive, sensible world. It should be timetabled and blanked off. So you know exactly what you're doing week in, week out. I know a lot of schools like to vary it, but when they vary it, you often find they take additional time on some weeks and it's promised us time in lieu. And you know what, that time in lieu very rarely comes back. PPA is 10% and it's contractual and you are entitled to it in law. Um, John, so can I ask who came up with that? Because I mean, I get, we, we get, um, double that, which I yeah. thought was what our I thought it was well, like one hour a day, but 10% is nothing. ECTs get 20% in their first year because they get 10% PPA and they get 10% ECT allowance. And in their second year, it will go down to 5%. So you'll get 15% off timetable. That's that's how that operates. But PPA has been around since the working directives in about 2005, 2006, it came out that academic year. Yeah, it just seems very low as a directive. Um, it, you know, most it, schools it, I've worked and you get more than that anyway. Like, yeah, it's 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 a minimum, and that in in some schools they will offer much more than the minimum. Fair play to them, but we've seen a tightening of belts in recent years, right. particularly if schools can afford it. Schools will quite happily provide that additional time because they recognise the benefit it gives and provides. But it is in in in, in statute, it's only a minimum recommendation, also a minimum obligation on the school to provide ten percent, and ten percent we all know. But the caveat you've got is that teachers under school teachers paying conditions have directed hours of 1265 a year and the school should be setting out how those hours are going to be spent now within those 1265 there is also the caveat within the stpcd which says and any reasonable additional hours that you're expected to work to fulfill your teacher's professional duties now how long are those additional reasonable hours yeah. My argument would always be the European Union Working Time Directive says 48, and that would be the maximum that any teacher would have to do in any given week. But typically, the working week is broken down to be, or working day is broken down to be 6.49. That's rounded up to 6.5 hours a working day of directed time. Um, but as I said, if anybody is working longer than a 48 hour week, European law is able there to turn around and say stop, and nobody can argue against that. Obviously, we'll have to wait and see what happens with the bonfire of the EU legislation, as Jacob Rees-Mogg is, is, is talking about, but 48 hours is protected in law as well. OK, uh, no, so yeah. those are just a couple of highlighted ones there. Obviously, you'll have the whole list passed forward to you. But in continued one, we've talked about you have a right to ongoing CPD. You also have a right to a work-life balance. That is essential, looking after yourself for the reasons we've talked about previously. I've also just mentioned ahead of looking at the slides, you are protected by the working hours maximum 48 directive. And I've also talked about the 1265 as well in advance. 
schools should be providing a breakdown of how that works based on their school day. And I'm in, I'm in process of developing uh, and road testing at the moment a working time calendar, which is based on an Excel spreadsheet where effectively any member of NSEAD can put in their hours based on the school hours and get a breakdown of how many working hours they've been allocated. And it's also hopefully, I'm just going to tweak a couple of things, it's hopefully going to be something that part-time teachers can use as well. And there is no working model out there on any union website that does part-time teachers too. So that is something we're hoping to roll out uh, within the next few weeks, um, subject to a few more beta tests, because um, it's I, I don't want people being able to change cells and functions. You can appreciate from an Excel background, it's a bit complicated. It will be a beautiful thing. It will be a beautiful <laughs> thing. We'll see, we'll see. I sincerely hope so. Um, from a part-time perspective, a lot of part-time teachers don't know this. If you work, say, Monday, Tuesday, uh, and then you work elsewhere, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, there's a parents' evening on Thursday. School cannot uh, compel you to attend that. That is not a working day for you. You're working on Mondays and Tuesdays. So they can pay you to attend that additionally, but many schools will turn around and make up some, you know, some, some kind of cod wad about it being part and parcel of your contract. It isn't. You can only be compelled to attend work on the days that you actually work. I mean, let's let's think about it logically. If you work in one you know, school A Monday and Tuesday and school B Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and they both have competing parents' evenings, you have to attend the one where you're working on the Thursday. You can't attend the other one. They've got no right to call you in for that. We've talked about um, 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 cover and whatever you previously. Cover in school should only be performed on a, a rarely sort of cover basis. Schools for foreseen absences, i.e. when people make an absence request in advance, should be bringing cover in for that person, for that teacher. And I would only say on, on an emergency basis, if somebody phones in sick on a, on, a, on, a, on a Wednesday morning, school could probably get away with saying rarely cover on a Wednesday morning up till about 10 o'clock. They've got up till that time, I would say, quite legitimately to argue, to, to phone up an agency and get supply in. You shouldn't be doing cover pretty much after 10 o'clock. So rarely cover is, is, is very much that. But a lot of schools are leaning on the goodwill of teachers, teachers who don't know their rights or teachers who are worried about enforcing their rights to turn around and give them additional workload. And you shouldn't be under that type of pressure. Importantly... Sean, um, could I ask a, ask a question on that? Of course, yeah. So with, um, you know, so if we're on our teaching load, even though that's, we get when it's more generous than the 10%. Yeah. Um, so if you're under that, then you'll get a, a cover lesson, which yes. is which is allocated on your timetable, which I'm assuming yeah. is fine. Um, but now yeah. I've lost my year 11s and 13s. Yeah. All of a sudden, like, cover's just gone through the roof. And although no. I appreciate they're saying, now you're not teaching this. So what, what the, is there anything, any rights around that that we have? This is... Brilliant. Yeah, I've just recently put onto the website and this tests your 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 capacity for picking the trade union things within the within the fortnightly newsletter as well. There has been an article within that, uh, not the, not the one that came out yesterday, but the one two weeks, two weeks hence, which talks about gains time and gains time. There are certain uses for gain time that you can use in school. And it's for things like, you know, year six moving up preparation um, but typically schools use that time for departmental work preparation reflection development of resources um, I've suggested to some departments in you know in, in years gone by that they actually develop a workload model so looking at the amount of gain and how they're going to allocate it and what member of staff is doing what task so somebody could be looking at a key stage three curriculum some could be looking at assessments somebody could be looking at other schemes of work or anything along those lines but that is gain time and shouldn't be used for cover but there is a definitive document on our website now um, that that identifies what gain time should be used for and schools that use it to take note to effectively say well we're going to save on the cover bill this this, this term, that's unacceptable because this is time where you have put additional time, let's be honest, into your year 11 and year, year 13 examination classes. Yeah. Don't forget all the, don't forget all the extra work where you've done the intervention at lunchtime or in your own time in that, in that additional period six that, you know, happens at the end of the day that doesn't get paid for as well. This needs to be remembered by, by actually looking after your gain time. 
And that is really, really quite crucial to looking after your workload and schools need to respect that. Um, you so know, this, I'm quite- we can, we can go with it. We've got um, the stuff in, in there that we can use to fight back against that. Certainly, certainly. And as I said, you know, a, a key thing from your departmental perspective, if you can identify a work plan and say, well, actually, we're going to be using the game time for this, that gives even more ammunition to you to say, actually, this isn't time where we're going to effectively put our feet up and have a jolly now because we worked mighty hard with the year 11s and 13s and now they've gone, it's our time. We're actually using this time to, to, to resource, to plan, to prepare for the new intake in September and for the courses that we've done as well this year, you know? So Yeah, I've done that, but they've yeah. just said that I can only ask request one of my double periods for that. This this is a frustrating element here. Um, you know, strictly speaking, yes, as a collective, you know, school staff can push back together, um, but it is going to be require a bit of a collective response if if leadership aren't hearing what you're saying there. Um, but the rights do exist in terms of how they should be using that. Um, an interesting one as well, which is an important element, uh, is the third one. It was in the school's paying conditions documents in about 2015, and it, and it was an, uh, a non-exhaustive list. But effectively, the gist of what paragraph three says there, if you are a qualified teacher, you should be using your skills and qualifications as a qualified teacher to do things that only a qualified teacher can do. This is why we don't do things like invigilation routinely these days. This is why we don't do things like putting up posters. This is why we shouldn't be doing things along like routine photocopying. You get the gist? And that is protected as a clear right. No routine administration, no collecting of dinner money, lunch monies, trip monies or anything along those lines. Only things that require the exercise of a teacher's skill and professional judgment should be done and performed by a qualified teacher. And again, a lot of schools have tried eroding those types of rights as well. Yeah. You're entitled under the Burgundy Book to 100 days sick pay, full pay, 100 days sick pay, half pay. Those are working days, by the way. So effectively, that's six months full pay and six months half pay. So those are enhanced rights that unions have fought for over a number of years. And at any meeting, which is a formal meeting on disciplinary capability, safeguarding perspectives, you have the right to be accompanied by a colleague or a trade union representative. That means me. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, listen, colleagues, if yeah. any of your rights have been trampled on, if your well-being has not been respected, uh, just give us a shout and we will unleash Sean. Um, <laughs> never never fails never fails we're over time uh so there we go that how's that for, for modeling uh well-being just to say please take care of yourselves um yeah, we've yeah. covered lots tonight um scratch the surface we will send in slides uh, and we will be doing more work uh, around this in resources meetings and so on uh, and we'll also take what you fed to us to to take into our work and the, the things that we do there are things out there to support you um the biggest one is your community whether that's at school level whether that's your 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 besties uh, getting together or whether it's the nsead community and we've talked about some of the ways that can operate get involved, use it, even if it's just getting on the, the Facebook group and uh, having a little vent and uh, looking for some moral support of an evening. It's, uh, it's a wonderful place to be. And we do have the Member Assistance Programme. You've probably got an Employee Assistance Programme in your school, uh, which it gives you access to counselling and all kinds of wellbeing resources. Um, the one that we provide for you, it's not nothing to do with your employer. They're all confidential, um, employers' ones and ours, but you may feel more comfortable accessing one via NSEAD. Uh, and if so, it's there for you. It's part of your membership benefits. Please use it. Um, and seriously, have an amazing summer break. Yeah. We'll see you all soon. Um, maybe Thanks, other comments. Bye. That's great. You're very welcome. Thanks very much. Bye bye. 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 Whew. Just about made it in time then, yeah? Goodness. <laughs>